Thanks for coming to Sage, waking up so early. Now we'll try to not put you asleep again with this short presentation, around 30 minutes between me and Tomas. Uh, we wanted to share a little bit about benchmarks and challenges and why do we believe we should do more of those, especially in biotech or tech bio, like they call it in the Silicon Valley. Um, so I'll give it a few minutes for folks to take a seat and then I'll get started. I'm the president of Sage, I'm Luca. I should have a name tag. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm here to tell you a little bit about challenges today. And let's start with Sage. What is Sage? How many of you have heard of Sage before? Okay, because you have to get here, right? So that's how you know it. Okay, great. Our mission is to drive a new age of discovery through truly open science and radical collaboration. So we're trying to bring open and collaborative practices that are common in, open, in other fields like computer science and physics to you know, biomedical sciences. And our vision is a world where there's no silos across biomedical sciences and everybody collaborates openly and understand each other's languages and we progress a lot, a lot faster. Uh, we are a uh, organization, a 501c3, so a nonprofit based here in Seattle, around 110 employees, um, scientists, engineers, and uh, governance folks, mostly that's, that's our um, um, workforce. And our motto is better science together. We really try to live and, and breathe that. Um, our dream is to do open science with closed data. It's not easy. It's easy to do open science with open data. You know, the CERN in, uh, uh, in Europe is, has taught us a lot about that when you have, you know, higher energy physics kind of data sets, no confidential information, you can open it up to the world. Everybody analyzes them. Higgs boson is found, other people confirm it, everybody wins, right? It's also easy to do not open science with not open data, right? Like that's what most of bioscience is, like the data is not open and everybody works on their little silos. And we kind of try to be in the middle. We try to enable large community, large access to data sets that might be sensitive and close. And so you have to be very careful about how you do that. That's why we have so many people that do governance in house that can really help understand, can you use this data for this reason, but not this other reason, because that's what the informed consent said, because that's what the data use agreement said. Um, we work with a bunch of folks. We've been around since 2009. So I don't know how many logos do you recognize here? Do you recognize at least one logo? Oh, okay. Okay, that's, that's why it's Seattle Tech Week and not Biotech Week. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are folks that are doing projects in this open science with closed data space. Uh, so trying to give broad accessibility to data sets that might contain uh, private and sensitive information. Um, and yeah, we try, we enable them. We enable them from a technology perspective. We enable them from an educational perspective. We enable them from just a staffing perspective. Our uh, stack is composed of three pillars. At the center, you have synapse.org, which is a data sharing platform. And in fact, I hear a lot of folks going around yesterday at a pregame event that already know and use and sometimes are unhappy with uh, Synapse um, um, because it serves a lot of people. So there has to be someone that's unhappy that gives us you know, things to improve. Uh, mm -hmm. We're one of the um, nine NIH listed uh, generalist repositories. So if you are an NIH researcher, you're collecting data funded by NIH, you have to share your data. This is now a mandate of the agency. And if you don't have a specific uh, repository for your own domain, then use a generalist repository. And uh, in that case, there's only nine of us out there. Um, and we're one of the few that allows sensitive data to be stored because we have this governance piece that really can do the switchboard between the contributors and the user. So that's synapse.org. You need data, go check it out. 20,000 data sets, two petabytes of data, plus uh, mostly sequence data, but also anything, digital health, um, images, you name it, okay? Um, unfortunately, that's not a great way of data, uh, of, of, uh, of um, uh, doing data reuse. It's a good way of doing data sharing, just like put your data out there, list it, and then people will come and they will request access and they will use it. That's the dream. Uh, if people don't find that data, they're not going to come. 
and ask for access. They're not going to see it. They're not going to look like what it is. You're trying to get people to come to your restaurant. You have to show them a menu, right? And uh, that's hard to do with closed data. And that's why we build portals on top of our data sets. And that's on the left-hand side. These are ways of navigating and exploring the data sets even before downloading. And then there's the thing that we'll be talking about today, which is challenges. What does challenges have to do with data? Well, challenges are a great way to give a data set a lot of visibility, a lot of reuse potential. These data sets becomes a benchmark data set. We'll see in a second what that, that means. And then lots of people come with their algorithm and try to solve a problem that's defined by a community on it. An example could be a data set is a set of mammography scans. And the problem you want to solve is detect if there's breast cancer there. And I claim my algorithm is better than yours. But how do we know that that's the case? So that's the second part of the presentation. Curious, what's the best LLM out there? This is not only going to be a show of hands. This is going to be a quantifiable exercise. Please take, take a picture at that QR code there and vote your favorite one. What's happening? OK. I'll give you two minutes. I was promised that we'll update online. Okay, good. Let's get to 20 at least. Can we? 15 maybe? Right, one more. Okay. okay, you guys got it. Best at what? Right? What is the performance metrics they were using to define what is best? Um, and this is a serious business in LLM world these days. So best of what got 14 plus votes. Uh, you know, the, the exercise went as expected. Um, if you try to answer best at what in LLM world today, you're, you're brought to dashboards that look like this. This is open LLM dashboard um, uh, on Hugging Face, which is a place where community of AI researchers get together and um, ranks open models, specifically this one, so open LLMs. Um, but then you have, you know, the whole first part of the slides, the slide is about what are you ranking them on? Average score across math kind of questions, GPAs kind of standardized tests. Are we testing them on translation? Are we testing them on poetry? Are we testing them on architecture choice? Are we testing them? Like, there's a lot of way you can test an LLM on. And there are standardized benchmarks for each of these different ways. And also, what kind of LLM are you scoring them against? You know, you can have like small LLM with very few parameters, very big LLM. And that's why you have the sliders back in the, in the, in the bottom side. Well, long story short, benchmark has become such a serious business, such a serious business in the AI world that when a new model is released, this is Llama 3.1, so last week, the day before it's released, the way it leaks and people already tell you, they already write in benchmark, they already tell you how it compares to all the other ones. Like all, all over the internet, there are people writing spreadsheets and say, oh, it's better on math uh, uh, as compared to Llama 3, but it's not better than GPT-4 as compared to translation. And, and it's all about how better or worse it is in all different dimensions. And most of the time, this actually comes from the people that write the model. You know, Meta came up with their own model card that scores Lama 3.1 across all these benchmarks that are out there. And if you don't do that, people will drag you to the arena. And I mean it. That's a chatbot arena. That's a service that online, if you log as a user, you're presented with two windows. There's two LLMs you don't know about, uh, you know, behind them. And then you choose a task. It could be math, or it could be you want to have a discussion about you know, translation. And then you interact with both of them. And then at the end, you vote which one was the better one. Right? You don't know who they are. And that's kind of like a game between the two LLMs, 
the one that wins gets a vote. And then they're all scored against each other like you would do in chess. In fact, they use ELO rating to rank the best one, okay? So if you have an LLM, you put it out there, for some whatever reason, you don't provide benchmark yourself, you will be dragged into the arena, right? Like you will be immediately compared with everybody else to understand which is better, which is worse in what domains, okay? When the goal is so clear, progress is fast. And the left-hand side is a, is a tweet of someone saying, wow, Llama 3.1 is destroying Mistral that was published three months ago, right? Like doing twice as better in most of the data, uh, the benchmark, GSM 8K, LSWOG, they have funny names like that. Uh, Human Evolve is, is, a, is a benchmark where you have to generate code based on doc, doc strings. So I give you a natural language description of code. The LLM has to generate the code for that, and then it's evaluated. And, and so, you know, Mistral, 50%, Lama 3, 76%. If you go and look at how we've gotten better as, you know, society, as humanity, in terms of like human evolved specifically, that's the right-hand side of the graph. You can find that on papers we code. We went from 25% in two years ago to, you know, close to 100% today. So that, that, that is a really hard problem. Like these are interview questions that you will get if you try to join Google or Meta or like any software engineering company. That's, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. And, you know, we're doing, we're doing okay. It's not perfect. A lot of people are questioning benchmarks that we have today. And that's also healthy, right? Benchmarks become uh, old and obsolete as, you know, people try to optimize for that specific metrics. Then you have to do new ones. But it's much better than not having a clue, which is what happens a little bit in health and bio. So why, is, why do you see that kind of speed? Why do you see that kind of progress in, in AI and computer science at large, in my opinion? Um, for a reason that is eloquently uh, um, elaborated, in my opinion, by David Donahoe, who's a you know, super famous statistician in, uh, uh, of Stanford. He's done everything in his life from uh, studying compressed sensing to do pure math uh, to, you know, more recently look at machine learning and, and really the social uh, implication of this. And, and he says, we are reaching a point of frictionless reproducibility in data science, which means that anybody can build on anybody else's also work very quickly. Okay. That's why you have such, a, such quick progress. And how, what is that enabled by? Three things, in his opinion, in my opinion as well. Data is open, easily accessible. Okay, you go to Hacking Face, data set is there, one liner, you load it, one liner, you train your model. Two, re execution is easy, meaning code is available, either through direct running or through direct API access. But you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to talk to people to get access to the code base. It's there, right? And then three, challenges. There is a benchmark that is agreed by the community, and it's true for everyone, and everybody looks up to that on how we're doing. When those three things are true, you're approaching fr frictionless reproducibility, which I think is what we're seeing in AI these days, in non-health and bio AI, that is. Because when I lean into a little bit of my split personality of AI researcher going to NeurIPS and KDD and AI conferences, and uh, you know, president of Sage and running a you know, health and bio um, organization and, 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 you know, one of the largest databases out there, uh, I usually run into this vignette, right? Like researchers, AI researchers, like super duper good people come to me and say, I know a lot of AI, I'm so motivated, I would love to work in health, I want to apply my skills to health, but there is no data out there. And I'm like, um, have you looked at Synapse? Have you looked at all of us workbench? Have you looked at UK Biobank? Have you looked at Biodata Catalyst? And the answer is no, 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 right? Like those are collectively probably, you know, close to 50 petabytes of data out there that we could, you know, leverage and build benchmarks on. And, um, and their answer is like, are those on hugging face, right? Like are those on hugging face? Because that's where you go look for frictionless data, frictionless code and leaderboard. Okay. So the data is there in health and bio. It's just not easily accessible. It does not allow frictionless reproducibility. That's why progress is so slow. And that's starting us. And this is research from uh, me and collaborators. We, on the left-hand side, we compared um, machine learning for health papers and code 
with other domains such as computer vision and NLP, so more more mature machine learning domain. And uh, you know, when you have stuff on the upper bisector of the different dimension we use, technical replicability, statistical replicability, and conceptual replicability, then it means that others are better. And you can see that pretty much in any case, NLP and computer vision have better replicability across all these dimensions. So again, in machine learning for health, the code is not there, the data is not there, the metrics are not clear as a consequence. And uh, right-hand side, I feel like it's even a more upsetting exa uh, example. This is from Lancet Digital of last year with a few collaborators from Vector Institute and MIT. Um, if you ask yourself, how well can we detect COVID from your wearable data? The answer was spun from pretty much no better than random to 90% accuracy, right? Like these are different papers with data sets that are not available, code that is mostly not available, right? And if you it's just like take a peek at the description of the data set, because again, the data is not available. Some of those have um, a, a number of COVID patients in their data sets that is below what is US prevalence, widely below. That's a logarithmic scale, by the way. Some of those have number of COVID patients that is like two order of magnitudes what you have in COVID prevalence. So it means like the data set is highly enriched for COVID. So they're solving completely different problems. Like one, you have people at the hospital that are coughing and, 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 and about to die from COVID. Easy to detect that with a wearable, right? Like you just have to, you know, basically see if there's a pulse. And then the other kind is like people that have COVID and no symptoms. Hard problem to solve, right? So are we 50% are we, are we AUC or are we 99% AUC with detecting COVID? We don't know because we don't have benchmarks. Right, so enter benchmarks and challenges a stage. That's one of the things we do. So if you live in a field where you feel like there are questions that are very important, but we don't have good answer to that, or we have a lot of people bringing algorithms, but we don't have you know, a common center of reference to compare those, then um, we can help. Um, so the way a, cha a challenge is organized, and I will tell you in a second a way we don't have to be involved. Like we really want everyone to be empowered to do this on their own. But you know, if you need help, we're here. Um, the way these are organized are you pose a question, you find a reference data set, um, you engage solvers, like you need to have a community of people that want to share their solution and compete with each other. And you know, we have a very large one that we leverage at Sage uh, with more than 30,000 uh, people. And it comes from the great legacy that Dream has, uh, has, uh, has enabled us to use. Dream is a dialogue for reverse engineering of assessments and methods. Yeah, and, and it's, a, and it's a, you know, the, the, the people that had the, the first, the wrote the first dream paper in back in 2013 really had a very long uh, view on how this should be become important in health and bio as well. Um, so you engage solvers, and then, then you have some infrastructure that can evaluate and compare models, and then you share results. Um, if you if you work at Kaggle, if you've done Kaggle competition, how many of you have done Kaggle competition? Three, four, five. Yeah, that's that's a similar idea. Those are data science competition. The difference is that most of the time you don't have to be so focused on a scientific question, right? Like those are questions that you know are more easily. Uh, derived from data set, it could be like optimize a recommendation system. While you know, in health and bio, you really have to be careful about the science uh, behind the question that you pose. One and two, um, the data usually is not sensitive, and and so this is a big point of why it's hard to do challenges in our world, because sometimes you can't even release the data set to participants because it's sensitive. But we have a solution for that. A lot of other people do. Uh, so, hold, stay with me. You can do open science with closed data. You can. It's not impossible. It's hard, but not impossible. Um, this is just to say it's quite complex and involved as a, as a, you know, from someone, you know, you might come to me, Andrew, and say, I have a challenge. I'm trying to understand what is the best algorithm to fold proteins. You know, that, that happened, and, and we know what it is. Um, and then we'll talk about that success story in a second. Um, but then, uh, you know, you'll come to me and we're like, well, what, what do you mean by folding, right? Like, what kind of proteins? Like, do you have a data set? Like, is it all proteins or, you know, only the human ones? Uh, and folding, how do we score? What do we achieve? 
you know, the perfect folding and how do we score, how far we are from the perfect folding. Um, then when the scientific question is figured out, you assemble a team, you get the data, that's usually the hardest part. If there's like a health, if the question is around EHR data, very hard because you have to work with a health system and have them be okay, you using their data to run this challenge. And I'll tell you in a second how you can do that. Anyway, and then, you know, I'm not gonna go through all the boxes, but it's a social, technical, scientific, legal issue to run a challenge. It's not easy, unfortunately, not yet. We would really love it to be, it's not yet. And um, this is a little bit um, too much for 9 a.m. in the morning. So if you have coffee, take a sip for it because we're gonna go through this diagram here. Um, but I, I think it's really important sometimes, sometimes to understand the details. And this is the only slides where there's gonna be details. How can you do open science with closed data? You, you BS in me, Luca, that's not possible, right? Like that should be the reaction. And, and the answer is, well, no, it is possible with a technique that's called federated benchmarking that we didn't invent, like some other folks came up with and we have our own implementation. You can find a lot of other folks out there um, using it. But the idea is that you want to do a challenge on a reference data set, but that data set cannot be given to participants to train their model and compare them on a leaderboard. So what do you do? Well, you create some synthetic replica of your data set that is not sensitive anymore. And that's a whole ordeal, right? In how to, you do that and proving. Um, and, and hopefully retains what's called high utility, which means it's similar to the original data set. Okay. Then you give that out to participants. They start doing model development on that. And they feel like, oh, okay, cool. I have a good model now to predict uh, breast cancer from, mammography, for, from synthetic mammography data. Now let's hand that model back to Sage. Sage will take it, will retrain it on the real data on a closed enclave. This is the right-hand side. The right-hand side on the orange is, is Sage only infrastructure that's not accessible by participant and then test it on a holdout set, okay? But so there is a retraining step, which is A, could be very expensive if you have a large model, uh, and B, it's probably gonna uh, lose some performance because you know, you're training synthetic data, is gonna be retrained on data that is not exactly the synthetic data you train on, um, but it might lose some performance, but it works. Like we've done it in a few challenges, Precision FDA, which is another challenge platform, has done in a few challenge, and it, it does give very good results. And, and uh, um, you know, the people that are coming at the top of the leaderboards, the score that they get on the leaderboards is very close to the score that we'll get on the synthetic data itself. So the, I don't think this is a generalizable method yet because how you generate synthetic data depends on whether you have a good generative model for that kind of data. So we do have that for EHR. We do have that for nodes because it's text. Don't we have, do we have that for sequences? No, not yet, right? Like the best DNA models are still falling pretty short from, from uh, mimicking a real DNA. But as we start having better generative models for different domain, for different verticals, you can start running challenges. Again, open communities, close data by creating synthetic replica. Um, okay, and now some, uh, some example, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Tomas. Uh, what is a challenge? Like what are the questions that are being asked in health and bio? You might ask. One is the one example I gave you before. You give him mammograms, detect breast cancer best algorithms win. And in, in this particular case, it win big. It win a million dollars. There was a prize at the top of this challenge, which made it super popular, as you can guess. And I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, the, the consequences of that, uh, the good consequences of that. Uh, but we ran challenges to detect uh, tuberculosis from voice recording. Uh, we ran challenges to detect uh, long COVID uh, from EHR and, and wearable data um, with predict mortality from EHR data, and uh, predict preterm birth from microbiome. Um, like really, li like for LLMs, pick a task, pick a reference data set, get algorithms to compare, and you know, tell, tell the world who's the winner. And, and again, this, it doesn't have to be Sage. You can go to challenges.synapse.org today and try to run your own challenge. Uh, this guy is here, the biomarking, Biomarkers of Aging Challenge. It's run on Synapse. I had no idea it was. I just met the guy who's running it a few, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, and it's like, oh, we're running a challenge with you. I'm like, no, you're not. 
It's like, yes, we are. Like, look, it's on Synapse. And I'm like, okay, it's working. So it, it's complicated again, because it's a social, technical, legal problem because, you know, sensitive data, open community and all that. But if you have all those, you know, social, technical, legal skills and scientific skills, you can do it yourself. And in fact, you're encouraged. And this is, this is up there for free, okay? Um, again, um, some success stories is challenges only there to, you know, move the field ahead and do frictionless reproducibility in health and bio and, you know, get cure uh, for cancer to our society, just that or something else as well. Uh, no, there's actually individual incentives that are, that could be big again in the digital mammography challenge, there was a million dollar prize. Turns out that two of the top three people that won that challenge six years later got FDA clearance on that algorithm. Okay. Let them, correlation is not causation, but my hope, my, my speculation is that maybe in the submission, there was some mention of the fact that the algorithm is being validated in the wild through a challenge. Um, and then you can have like the other orthogonal and beautiful consequence of challenges. You have people that don't know anything about the science. Like you open it up to different communities, computational community, people with different science background. And in this particular case, third place, high school students. Okay. High school students, like where else high school students can wrestle and, 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 and grapple with science problems. Right, like this, this is to me is an incredible education opportunity, like to, to open up the, the importance of this question to a community that's bigger than the one that generates the data. Okay. All right. So are you ready? Are you ready to accept the challenge? So if you want to organize a challenge, what do you need? Well, you need data. You need a question or just an idea of a question that we can help you refine it. And you need funding because, you know, that large graph, social, technical, legal problem, it costs some money. Uh, if you are a participant, what are you getting out of it? Well, you're getting a lot of other folks benchmarking your solution. So you actually know if, you're, if, you're, if you say you're good and you just say it or you actually are. Um, and uh, you get to see data, right? A lot of participants, a lot of time are like, they are looking for data, like, you know, the vignette and neurops that, that I had, and you give them the chance to see some data set that's actually really well curated for that specific task. Um, it helps them to grow and, you know, educate people all from all walks of life, including uh, even high school. And, and it creates trust and credibility around a specific um, task and, and, and community. Like we understand what good looks like for a specific question, which is, incredibly important for the field. Um, I'm gonna conclude by hoping, I, I come from you know, the AI community. I've seen what ImageNet has done for deep learning. ImageNet is a competition where you have to create an algorithm that classifies images and say, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a bird. And uh, you know, there was a lot of mess in the field up until 15 years ago, until Faithful Lee came uh, and others came around and said, let's create a great reference data set. We call that ImageNet, okay? And then someone else, some of her students actually came and said, let's run a competition around this reference data set now. And that's where on the right hand side, you see at some point 2012, the error rate on classification drop majestically. And that's where the first CNN algorithm was introduced. So called convolutional neural network, which is the gold standard right now in computer vision. And you know, from there, you know the rest of the story, right? Um, it, it all started from this. We have something like that in health and bio, right? Like you probably heard, have the, heard the success story of AlphaFold, best algorithm out there to predict protein folding. It also came out from a competition. It's called CASP. And that's the leaderboard, right? Like that's to see everybody else and then AlphaFold. When you see this kind of like quantum leap, you know we're onto something as society. I would love to see a lot of those quantum leaps for a lot of the tasks that we have in health and bio. With that, that said, I uh, want to give a shout out to the folks that are involved in uh, running and building challenges at Sage. I put images up for some of those, but there are more than six. And also a um, shout out, we are hiring a director for this team. So if you're interested in this uh, position, please apply. That's the QR code or just go to Sage by uh, slash careers. Um, with that, I'll leave it over to Tomas, which is the guy bottom left, who's going to show you a little bit of uh, of demo and uh, and uh, another public service that we're running. 
So hi, my name is Thomas Schatter. I'm a solution architect working at Sage. And um, yeah, the, the um, challenge ecosystem is really fragmented. And um, so here, for example, you can, we have identified more than 25 organizations that leverage health data that organize these challenges. But let's say you are a participant, you want to, you know, you have some time, you want to contribute to the, the challenges that this organization make available, then you need to go to many different websites and, and, and that's, uh, that takes time. So yeah, more than 25 organizations here really focusing on the ones that leverage um, health data like mammogram images, genomic data. Um, but the issue is that there is a lack of standardization. So for example, what an organization may call a task, another organization may call it a sub challenge. So there's different terminologies there is no central hub where you could go as a participant and search for a, for a challenge. And yes, yeah, searches are, are really time consuming. And then on the other end, so you have the, the challenge organizer. And what you want to do is really maximize the visibility of your challenge. Not only advertise your challenge on your own website, where only the people who know about it are, are going to look for it. So we developed a, a tool called Open Challenges, and it's available on openchallenges.io. And our approach was first to look at the, the challenges that, the, that these 25 plus organizations are running, and then come up with a standard terminology, vocabulary. And then we, we collect the data from these different websites. We map them to this common uh, Open Challenges schema. And then we make this data available in, a, in an application which is a web application running on openchallenges.io. Uh -huh. You wanna show that? Oh yes, please. And finally, we work with the communities to make sure that their data looks good in, in openchallenges.io. So here you have our app, um, again, really focusing for now on the, the challenges that leverage health data. We currently have more than 500 uh, challenges registered, uh, organized by for more than 400 organizations. And these challenges are organized. Um, they come from 15 different platforms. So that's where you would go as a participant, register, download the data, read the docs, uh, submit your tool, and then access the, the leaderboard. Um, here, we always like to show uh, every day three different challenges, the challenges of the day picked randomly from, uh, from our database. Um, if you know about a challenge that's not registered yet, you can uh, let us know and, and then it will appear in open challenges. And yeah, here again, some, some organization we are featuring and here are the different platforms where these challenges are organized. So you see Synapse, which is uh, the platform developed by Sage, uh, but you, you also see Kaggle, Nightingale and, and more. And just quickly, you can search organizations uh, you can search challenges. So here, for example, if we are only interested in challenges uh, about cancer, bam, here very quickly, you get the, these challenges. So there are currently more than, than 100. And then you can filter by type of incentives. So let's say you're interested in monetary incentives or you're interested in the opportunity to publish a scientific paper. Um, then you can select here, um, yeah access the challenges that are currently active or will, that will become active soon or challenges that are complete. You can also filter by category, whether the challenge is a hackathon, so maybe orga just organized on like a couple of days. Uh, if the challenge is going to start soon, close, close soon. You can filter by different, the different 15 platform you saw before and, and so on. So yeah. So here is a open challenges. So here is a QR code. If you scan it, you will only see the challenges that are currently upcoming or active. So that represents more than 100 challenges. I think actually 111. So uh, plenty of opportunity if you want to contribute to, to one of these uh, uh, challenge and help, help science. And we also have a Discord server where you can join us and, and chat, ask questions about challenges. And with that, I want to thank you for being here today.
thanks for sitting through this. Um, I guess we can take some questions and uh, after that continue our breakfast and networking until 10, I see Kate, until 10. Yeah, so we have 45 more minutes to chat. So question about a presentation or we'll go back to the room and continue to get coffee. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I will repeat the question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I will repeat the question. Um, so the question is, um, you said uh, you introduced yourself as a non-technical person. You're interested to see where this is going to go. And um, uh, what, what is the impact on on healthcare and it is also going to use uh and you're asking also if it's going to use data from the uk um international sets okay so um one 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 thing to to start is um what tomas just show openchallenges.io is a register of all people that are running challenges now the challenge itself depending on which one we pick are the one that are going to move the field forward okay and uh, which one are those? Um, I don't know. In fact, there is a big push in the field to get some, some sort of like list of open problem that the field could agree on and we should focus on. Like kind of like 23 problems of Hilbert as you know, David Hilbert, if for those of you who have a background in math, uh, you know, did at the beginning of 1900 and you know, hyper focus the community to focus on those 23 and not the other one. Um, so I think, I think that's a great question and the community needs to come um, around at that. I feel like today what I'm seeing the most developed are um, benchmarking and challenges either very early on on the biology side of things to all the way to, to protein. So where you can stay away from human subject issues. Um, so alpha fold is a great example. Like this just a, basically it's a physics problem, right? It's only about protein, how they fold. Um, I feel like as, as, you, as you get closer to sequences in DNA that you start getting into reidentifiability constraint and then you know these challenges become harder to, to do. Um, on the healthcare side, I'm seeing a lot of um, a lot of activation there too. There is now a group called Chai. Um, you know you know about them, right? Uh, that wants to um, build an assurance lab that are basically evaluation and, and, and certification um, 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 authorities for lack of a better word, they're not gonna be authorities like the FDA is, but like they're, they're gonna be someone that will look up to say if certain models in healthcare are um, good or not. So they will be validating models such as, for example, sepsis prediction based on ICU data. So it's, it's like in clinic, uh, healthcare focus, um, patient facing models, I feel like will be the first one that will go through this uh, benchmarking revolution, if you wanna call it that way. What about international data sets? Well, that's, a, that's an, another layer of complication, right? Like if you're trying to work with data sets in, in Europe, you have, you have to deal with GDPR. And uh, um, you know, then the, the legal bubble that you see in that uh, graph becomes the biggest one uh, of the whole process there. So it, this is not to say that it shouldn't be done. In fact, we, we should invest in, in doing some more of that, but I feel like most of the solution I've seen so far, that's not all the SAGE are, are US centric. Um, because as you, again, move towards re-identifiability risk, the approach between US and EU is, is very different. Um, yeah, and it's easier here for now. Yeah, yeah, so that's the thing actually I didn't touch on almost at all, like what happens at the end of a challenge, right? So in the, in the Kaggle competition setting, usually, you know, 
you like you get a gold star. Like you go to Reddit and say, I won this competition. You become a guru. You go get to Google and you hire for half a million dollar a year, right? And, and, and in, in the bio world, um, the, sometimes there's money, like we saw earlier. But most of the time, the reward is really bringing the community of solvers together post challenges. So what do we do is the scientific work that we do at the beginning to frame the question, we keep it going all towards the challenge. And at the end, we re-engage, let's say, the top 10 and uh, ask them to share the model for non-commercial setting, uh, non-commercial use, and ask them to come together and write a paper together about the learnings. Like, what are the models that won? Uh, what if we do an ensemble of the top 10? Does it get better than the first one? So I can send you, and I should have it on my list, I can send you paper, even like highly ranked and cited papers that come out of challenges because of that scientific exercise you do at the end of a challenge of bringing the community back together to see what do we learn. Um, if you go to, yeah, Thomas. I can, so, so yeah, all, most of the challenge, all I would say the challenges that we organize. So there is a leaderboard table and directly from the leaderboard table, you can click on download or the, the URL to download the, the container with Docker. So it's a, it's a requirement that we said that if you want to be eligible for the incentives, whether, whether it's the monetary, the cash price, or the opportunity to be invited to the conference to present your tool, your tool must be open sourced and um, yeah, be available after the challenge. So that's a requirement we set. Oh, I have to repeat the question. Sorry, keep me honest on this because otherwise people on YouTube will not hear. One more question. Actually, I'll give you the, mic the microphone easier. Hi, um, my name is John and I'm curious, uh, what are the computational or data center costs for the participants, both in terms of um, the folks um, entering into the competition as well as um, the folks on the other side of the uh, blinded data that's then doing the scoring? That's a great question and, and mostly, mostly, unfortunately, an unsolved problem. Um, so here is where health and bio being behind hits the good way in the sense that people are not using large capacity models that much yet. They're not using LLM that much yet, though we're thinking about running a challenge on them. And so the, the cost of training, usually it's at most in the $100 for, by participants that we absorb as an organization. In fact, it goes in the cost of paying for a challenge. Um, we've been thinking, we've been experimenting in other models where the participant pay, but that really decreases accessibility, obviously. And uh, we don't have a good solution for high capacity model that might take, you know, hundreds uh, of thousands of dollars to, to even just retrain. Like the, uh, the federated benchmarking I showed earlier, like you have to retrain the model inside the cloud. That's, you know, for a LLM, that's just impossible to do, right? Um, so. You know, get, you, get, you all have an idea on how to do that uh, at a low price, low cost? Come talk to me. Unsolved problem. Do you want to add something to us to that? No? Okay. One more question. Great. Thank you for the presentation and really love the collaborative approach that you're trying to drive. Um, one question I just had was, especially when you're looking at end solutions that might result in an FDA approved product or drug, how does the um, patents and or proprietary information fall into these challenges? That is a fantastic question and one that we get a lot. Um, <clears throat> here, I think we have to go a little bit on the details to, to understand how to do open science with closed data. Uh, again, it's, and, and here, the closed applies not to sensitiveness, but much more to proprietoriness of, of, the, of the solution and not necessarily of the data, but of the algorithm that are being created, okay? And, and I think we have to be nuanced to understand how to, you know, to walk this line that's in between two extremes, completely closed or completely open. Like one thing that we, we do and, and uh, you know, other folks that independently have to use Synapse uh, to run their challenges are doing is that, that your model needs to be made source available. So technically it's not open source by OSI definition because of OSI definition of open source is that it's source available so everyone can see and download the code, but also it's unrestricted use. You can do anything with that, okay? 
that's the real OG definition of open source. Um, if you if you take uh, just a small step below that, where the code is available, readable by everyone, but can only be used for research setting, so a non-commercial license, right? A lot of people still call that open source. It is technically incorrect if you really want to put your pundit hat on. Uh, but you know, let's let's say this. You know, it, you can read it. You can you can use it. Then 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 you have your your, your cake and you can eat it too because you have the scientific reproducibility that's still enabled, right? Like everyone can take the model, modify it, republish, do whatever. But if you try to build a product or if you're trying to, you know, use it for an asset or you're trying to do any commercial downstream, you have to come back and license it with the participant. So it, it can even become a marketing engine in some ways, right? Like you, a way of giving a visibility to your model. Now, is this a perfect system? No, not necessarily, because this model could be put in the cloud behind closed door and, you know, good luck proving that it was the original one that the participants submitted. Uh, so, you know, you have to settle that in a court of law. Um, but it's it's a good deterrent, and I think it's the best we can do so far to kind of have the best of both worlds. Yeah, uh, I mean, depending on how hungry you are, right? Uh, <laughs> we can maybe a couple more questions, maybe. Yeah. This is yeah, uh, so one thing that I'm always thinking of with the biomedical challenges specifically is once you start opening it up and trying to get as many people as possible participating, um, you can really introduce a lot of bias both in the data itself and in the question being asked, right? So like the biomarkers of aging, um, I think one of the best biomarkers of, you know, like not having cognitive decline as you get older is to be relatively wealthy. Um so what are some tools or resources that we can provide to people to try to prevent that type of bias or at least make it more known and, and explicit as we set up challenges and run them and evaluate them? I think that's a wonderful point and a point that's much more advanced in the AI community right now because they've been doing this for, for a longer time. And so, for example, for LLM, you don't have a single benchmark, right? Like you have... 20. And, and, and all of those are like continuously um, rediscussed and, and challenged and, and changed. And like there's a whole community driven process to decide what is the right um, uh, benchmark, which in some way should, you know, counter the bias you're, you're, you're talking about, or at least, you know, smooth it in, in a community setting. So, you know, in, in health and bio, we don't have that community driven effort yet. I think it could be spearheaded by playbooks. Uh, by, by what? Ty okay. okay, there's a there is a shout out to Chiron Toolkit, which is a toolkit in in the sense of like a, a set of uh, um, a set of you know uh, documents and, and policies. It's not a toolkit in the software sense, uh, but it's it's a it's a playbook to understand how you know you can actually answer the question that Abby was saying. Like, how do you bring community together in an unbiased way and make them aware of the bias they might have? And it can be applying to the data sets and it could be applying to the solutions that are being uh, submitted. So um, go to um, our, our uh, if you go to our blog post on Synapse, uh, there is a whole series on what's called Chiron, C-H-I-R-O-N, which is this toolkit to do community-driven engagement around problems like the one we discussed. Thanks for the, thanks for the call out. I'm going to piggyback on her question because I've never heard of this challenge before. So uh, being that it's not like advertised heavily on social media, how do you ensure that a diverse group of people are taking the challenge to get a diverse set of data points in the first place if it's not readily available to the general public? I, I, I didn't get your point. Are you saying we should make sure or are we making sure already? Well, it, it, are you, how are you making sure that a, a variety of people will take this type of challenge? Um, it, it, it's hard. I think um, in our case, our community, the dream community, first of all, is an international community, which is not, it's not US based only. And I think that's already great. Um, and then I don't know if I have a map of where the participants come from, but it's not just the global north. Um, so at least we have 
some diversity in geography and some diversity in uh, education. I, I don't think I have the map there. Um, but again, yeah, we don't, a lot of these participants, we don't get to meet in person. So we don't, we don't, you know, we really are sometimes not able to, you know, try to bring other community in. Although I highly recommend if you ever join a challenge, when you um, join the community driven tools that surround the challenge, which usually is the Discord, Discord channel, that's where you can bring on the community you think are missing. Like these are open exercise, right? Like, so if you feel like there is someone missing, you have a chance of bringing them in. We're doing some of that work, but it's never perfect, as you know. Let's say one last question, then we go back to croissants. Yeah. Is there any like demographic data collected on the type of participants um, for challenges like this? We, we on Synapse personally don't. Uh, some of uh, just just location, right? Um, and probably some anecdotal based on the top ten participant. We the one we engage with at the end to write a paper because you know then we meet and greet them we invite them at conference and stuff so uh, i think we might have a good idea of those but not a large i think some of that is by choice right like not not wanting to you know burden the participant with too much information i think um you you should check the other 25 or 24 platform that are out there um i think i think it's a good question and i think yeah we we should be aware of who's participating rather, you know, beyond the dimension of high school, not high school, or Italy, not Italy. Yeah, thanks for the, the feedback there. Mm. Okay, yeah, well, send us off, Chris. Um, one of the things I noticed about your sponsor group is that it was largely nonprofit entities. And one of the challenges we were discussing last night is bringing commercial entities into the fold of sponsoring competitions like this. Even in the face of the type of synthetic data generation, transit, closed environment type of protections, the mandate that the sort of respondent algorithms be open source is likely problematic for say a venture backed entity who's generated this data worked to synthesize a representative data set and so on in as much as they probably need to avoid creating competition for themselves in the marketplace so how do you think about you know extending this into a, a places where a lot of the really foundational data for biology you know companies like incitro or more recently zara are going to be generating these really impactful data sets and yet we want to gain access. How do you bridge that gap? Thanks for the question. Uh, that's, uh, you know, something that keeps me up at night. Um, well, first of all, we have to pick our battles. And as Sage, we're a nonprofit that's trying to bring collaborative practice to biomedicine. So we, we are always going to nudge, you know, in the open uh, science, uh, source, anything direction. I think that for... Um, there's two points there that you're making. Like one is around the data and one is around the model. I think the data could really be very protected, right? Like in the uh, federated benchmarking setting that I was showing earlier, like participants never see the data. They see a synthetic replica of it. And I think you can build that replica with a lot of guarantees for the people that are data contributors to, you know, your IP is not going to be stolen. Your participant are not going to be identified. And by the way, you're going to learn because that's the interest of the data contributors that most of the time is also the challenge organizer, you're going to learn in a non-competitive way if the task that you really care about is even solvable, right? Like this, this is like one way of looking at it is you're getting labor for quite cheap, you know, engaging all this community. So there is a direct benefit for folks that are interested and they have like a question that they might not want to spin out the data science team internally but I want to see first, you know, let, let's, you know, let it loose in the community and see how well the community does. Oh, uh, AUC 0.5, let's not care about that, right? Um, so I, I, I hope there's the incentives piece that also transpire, uh, transpires on, on the data side. On the model side of thing, I think, um, you know, we run challenges where we request the model to be open. Um, you can run your challenge as well, right? Synapse is out there. 
um, you can run your challenge where you don't require models to be open and that maybe gets in more industry in submitting the models and I think that's perfectly fine, right? Like as long as there is more benchmarking in the field, I feel we all win. So that, that will be my answer. Thanks, Chris, for the question. Um, for any other, you have another question. No, yeah, yeah, you're clapping. Okay, great. All right. Uh, for any other question, we can, you know, have a chat the, uh, near the breakfast piece. And uh, again, thanks again for coming and uh, welcome to Tech Week. Let me let me stop the stream and then